So welcome back from the break. And I hope all of us are wide awake <laughs> after coffee and lots of sugar. Uh, so <laughs> what I'm going to talk about now is about the resources, the shared annotated resources that we have in the clinical domain. And also I will highlight some of the applications that some of the components that we have built from those annotations. And I'm not going to talk about actual applications, but if we have time at the very end, maybe I can show you some uh, real applications, um, especially in translational science, uh, pharmacovigilance, that we have built of the NLP um, annotations that I'm going to show you. So the first question is, how can NLP help biomedicine? And in Lynette's talk, we had a very compelling news case of uh, biomedical literature curation. But then in a completely different domain, that's the clinical domain, the point of care, how can NLP help medicine? So this is one of the questions um, that we have been trying to answer with many applications. So we see that there are many tools um, and they're very task-specific tools, and the knowledge within them is not very reusable. So for example, if, you, if somebody wants to extract, uh, let's say, uh, documents associated with magnet injuries, and this is a real use case, so kids actually swallow magnets, and that causes, um, uh, that can actually lead to death. If a physician wants to study uh, the magnet injuries and extract um, all the notes and patients with magnet-related injuries, they can build a very simple regular-based expression tool that will do the work. But that tool is very task-specific, and you cannot reuse it, for example, to discover patients with rheumatoid arthritis and the disease activity associated with that disease. So there are multi, a multitude of these tools, um, but there is no general framework um, to actually approach uh, NLP problems um, in medicine. There is also no standard large data sets uh, and very few common tasks for the community to advance and build off of each other's progress. So what we want to do is to push the, bay, the frontiers of semantic understanding of the clinical narrative and to do what the general, the open community did with Pantree Bank and the other annotated data sets. So we want to build shared uh, annotated resources that are flexible, that are reusable, and, that, and whose schemas are expandable and the guidelines are compatible with what's done in the general community. So, and also build the tools in such a way that they facilitate the end applications in the clinical domain, which are information extraction, searches, question answering, summarization, uh, pattern discovery, data mining. So what are the research questions associated with building such resources? The first one is the logistics, and Wendy will talk more about the logistics. What are the mechanisms of storing and delivering of those resources and the annotations? Um, unlike any other domain, we have privacy issues, and we also have legal considerations. So how can we deal with those constraints and yet build tools um, and resources that we can share with the community? We also have RBs. So every um, study that touches uh, patient records has to have an approved RB. So how do we deal with that constraint as well? Um, another very big topic is the annotation process. And we already heard from um, several of the speakers about um, active learning, uh, the importance of the tools, um, the interfaces, the efficient workflows, and um, the uh, expertise associated with annotating clinical data. 
Also, another topic is the annotation schemas. What to annotate? How to annotate it? So, the linguistic annotations, um, which ones do we need? The domain annotations, which ones are the important ones? How do we build a core of annotations that is reusable? The guiding principles that we decided, um, we as a community, are trying to follow are the following. First, we want to build general purpose annotations, and yet they are specific enough so that can be used for clinical applications, that we do not then reinvent the wheel. If there are standards and conventions in the domain, we actually use them and follow them and extend where, where necessary. So, for example, Pen Tree Bank, Guidelines, Time ML, um, previous semantic schemas, terminologies, and ontologies as such existing standards and conventions. For now, in the guidelines, we want to be very, uh, and in the annotations, we want to be very explicit that no inferencing um, should be um, included in the annotations whenever possible. Um, our approach has been the approach of layered annotations. Um, and, and that's based on our belief that the robust semantic parsing can be achieved through those layered annotations and combining them either as components or as one joint model. And you will see the many layers that we are trying to annotate. Also, at this point, we are not trying to annotate everything in the clinical note. For those of you who have looked at clinical notes, you know that there is a wealth of information, that you can annotate not only clinical events and diseases and disorders, but there are a number of other types of information that are important. However, for now, we are constraining to the most important, the most frequent um, events within the clinical note. So I will now uh, focus on several of the annotation projects that I'm involved in, and also several of the uh, people who are in the audience are involved in those uh, projects. So the first one is the SHARE project, or the Shared Annotated Resources. Um, it's a project that started by uh, the AMIA NLP group um, probably two, three years ago, and now it's a fully funded NIH project. The research focus is uh, to develop an annotation schema and guidelines, annotation process and workflow, and actually build a baseline schema, um, sorry, a baseline tool from those annotations. We are annotating a corpus of about 500,000 uh, tokens, and they come from the MIMIC database, and the MIMIC database includes um, ICU um, notes from uh, Beth Israel um, uh, Hospital in Boston, and they focus around cardiovascular events. Um, the first layer of annotations is the syntactic information, and that includes the part of speech uh, tags and the phrase chunking. On top of that, we are annotating clinical entities, and I mentioned that we try to follow existing standards and conventions in the, um, in the domain. We are using uh, UMLS as a definition of the disorders. And within the UMLS, we are filtering by uh, widely used uh, ontology, and that's NOMAD CT. So right here, you see the modifiers that we annotate associated with each disorder mentioned. So you will have the text pen, then the UMLS GUI, and Harry showed you an example of the UMLS GUI, temporal expressions, the temporal relation to the doc time, the course of the event, the severity of the event, the anatomical side, negation, uncertainty, generic, conditional, and experiencer. So it's a fairly complicated annotation project. So you can think of this as annotating a template associated with a disorder clinical event. So now that poses then other questions. How do you actually um, compute inter-annotated agreement over such a complex um, 
annotation data structure. So we are very happy to announce that we have one third of the corpus completely ready. It's double annotated and it's fully adjudicated. We also have the part of speech tags and the syntactic chunks. The format of the annotations is the notator. And also we output um, following the ISO uh, OLAF graph format. Um, so the only thing that we, had, we have left to do is to find a mechanism to actually release the corpus. Our hope is that by the end of the year, we will have that mechanism. So those of you who are interested in the corpus, feel free to contact me or Wendy, and we will try to get you at least the first part of the corpus. Um, so this is the share corpus. So now I'm moving to another corpus, um, and it's um, uh, dubbed as the MyPack corpus. And MyPack starts for, uh, stands for Multi-Source Integrated Platform for Answering Clinical Questions. And that's a project that I'm involved with, with in collaboration with Martha Palmer, Jim Martin, and Wayne Ward at University of Colorado, and also um, uh, co-investigators from the Mayo Clinic. So this corpus is completely done. And if you would like to have access to that corpus, please email me. Again, you have to go through a data use agreement process and you will be able to get all the annotations. So now, what, what are the annotations? Although the annotations were done in the context of a question answering system, the first two... Um, subparts of the corpus are not specific to question answering. So this is um, annotated clinical narrative, about 150,000 words, and then 50,000 words of Medpedia content, which is a medical uh, encyclopedia. The layers of annotations are what I mentioned to you, part of speech tags, tree banking, prop banking, the UMLS entities and their modifiers, UMLS relations and modifiers, and coreference. All these annotations are compatible with uh, the share annotations. So you can combine the two corpora. So um, Lynette raised the point, how much of the linguistic annotations do we need? How much of the part of speech tagging and the tree banking we need? And since we are starting from ground zero, probably we need some. So I would argue we would need at least something of the size of the pen tree bank to actually develop the um, upstream, the upstream technologies and components that are needed for downstream applications. So if we want to get to the semantics of the clinical narrative, we definitely need to have some of those lower level components trained specifically on clinical data. Uh, some characteristics of the MyPack corpus, uh, about 13,000 sentences, uh, about 2,000 uh, distinct predicate lemmas, about 29,000 named entities, um, and the inter-annotated agreement results are here, and we report them not in terms of kappa, they are in terms of the F1 score. Um, tree bank, prop bank, and the named entities. So, more characteristics of the MyPack corpus, these are the distributions of the prop bank arguments. Um, so these are the numbered arguments, arc zero through arc four, and then the modifier argument. So you'll see the most frequent one, not surprisingly, is the arc zero. Um, then this is the distribution over the UMLS semantic groups, and this is by frequency. So procedures and disorders and anatomical sites are the most frequent in the clinical data. So now the question is, what did we do with these annotations and what can you actually do with these annotations? So we took the annotations and we built components uh, trained on uh, the clinical data. All of them are released open source and in CTEX, 
uh, and now CTEX is part of the Apache Software Foundation. This is the URL for those of you who don't know um, uh, CTEX. So we built several components of the MyPack corpus. Um, and as I said, they're not specific to question answering. They are usable components, part of speech tagger, dependency parser, constituency parser, and semantic role labeler. These are the results of the evaluation of the components. Um, so what this tells you is that we use the Wall Street Journal. When you use the Wall Street Journal, these are the results that you get. Um, when you use the Wall Street Journal in size comparable to the MyPack size, this is what you get. Then the MyPack corpus, then the combination of Wall Street Journal and MyPack equal size, and then the entire Wall Street Journal and MyPack. And the take home message is that domain adaptation does help. And we all know that. And it helps significantly. So if you're relying on tools built on the Wall Street Journal, uh, the performance degrades significantly. So these are the models. The best performing models are the ones that are released in CTEX. Another annotation project, large-scale annotation project compatible with SHARE and MyPack is the SHARP project. Again, it's a collaboration with University of Colorado, uh, my group, and also the Mayo Clinic. So we are annotating 500,000 words of clinical narrative, the same layers as MyPack, with the addition of a template annotation. So this is work in progress. We don't have data to release yet, unlike Share and MyPack. And here's how the templates look. The templates are based on um, what's uh, called the clinical element model. So it is um, um, the clinical element model is created by domain experts. So we use that model to create the templates for the six semantic types that we are discovering. So now, a high-level component that we built of the share, the MyPack, and the Sharp N uh, annotations. And again, this is released in CTEX. This is a relation discovery component. And two of the relations are the location of and the degree of UMLS relations. Location of tells you the uh, anatomical site associated with the uh, clinical event, and degree of is the severity of the event, um, how severe a condition is. So it's um, the relation um, extraction is cast as a classification task, and these are the results from the two, uh, on the two corpora uh, in terms of an F-score. So the severity has a very high uh, performance, and the location of is really good as well. Um, the next and probably that will be the final project that I'm going to present now is the TIME uh, project and TIME stands for Temporal Histories of Medical, of your medical events. Temporality and temporal relations are very important in the clinical domain. There are a number of temporal uh, queries that are um, very frequently asked related to translational medicine and point of care, and some of those uh, temporal questions are right here. Um, so we are now adding the layer of temporal annotations to what you have already oops, seen. So here's an example sentence. A rash developed following surgery on 615, which we treated with hydrocortisone. So first we have to discover the events, and the events are listed right here. And each event is associated with the document time. Um, the relations are before, after, and overlap with the document time. Then 
Temporal expressions of time max trees uh, in the language of ISO time ML are also discovered, and there is one such uh, temporal expression. This is 615. So these are the building blocks to the temporal relations. The next step is to actually create the links between the events and an event and a temporal expression. So here are some examples of those links. So they're binary, uh, pairwise uh, links over which an inference can be run to actually give you a timeline. So the end goal of what we are doing is to create a timeline representation out of the textual um, part of the clinical narrative. So the funding um, I want to acknowledge all the uh, NIH-funded projects uh, that involve um, annotations. Um, and I think, yeah, so that's the end of the slide. So what, I guess the main point is that we are creating the lexical resources to um, build a core, um, the core components necessary to actually start doing semantic parsing of the clinical narrative. And we are making them available to the community, we are building them on top of existing standards and conventions, and we are extending those standards and conventions uh, to the clinical domain where necessary. We can, yeah. Now, Wendy is going to address the very exciting topic of how we make these annotations available to you. Yeah, except I don't have any answers. I just have questions. Oh, no questions? Well, well, I was thinking since this is a panel, maybe we'll like do this and then, and then we'll have questions to both of us at the end, if that's okay. Seeing my like connect to the internet icon here because I do want to go to some an internet site, but I there that was strange. So building on what Lynette said, you know, how do you curate this data, where do you put it, how do you distribute it, and we don't have answers to this. Right now, the way you'll get a lot of the data is you'll go to the people who have developed it and you'll sign DUAs with lots of institutions because the data comes from lots of institutions. And uh, sometimes you can get the annotations in, in one place, but you have to go somewhere else to get the data, and it, it's complicated. It would be really nice if we had one place where everything was so that everyone could go to that one place, and then that one place could kind of manage all the different um, legal um, issues involved and the technical issues. We don't have that yet, but I just want to discuss some of the possibilities. So of course, privacy and security are one of the main um, barriers to being able to share these data. But then there's also a lot of logistics that get in the way, the, the business model and the DUAs from the different institutions, the data use agreements. So in security, you know, there are cloud servers now that can host data that everyone can go and, and, and get their data from there. But there's still a lot of trust issues, I think, especially with hospitals, about sending their data onto some cloud somewhere else. Um, if, you, if you store it in a local place, you know, it's not so easy to create a really trusted environment in your local, local um, institution. And then if you're just storing it on your laptop or things like that, everyone knows that that can be a big issue. Privacy, then, is protecting the data from the insiders, and that's a big issue. How do we distribute this data? And, and this, when, when I created the, um, the corpus at the University of Pittsburgh, 
and I talked with the security officer at UPMC. This is, he said, this is our main goal. How do we distribute this data but keep our faces out of the newspaper? We do not want to be in the newspaper, Wendy. <laughs> so that, that's the whole goal, I think, of mainly of these um, security officers. So what's our due diligence in trying to protect the data from, from misuse? And of course, it's this balance between usability and protection. And the, I think that the state of the art and what people are going with is data use agreements. Even if it's the identified data, you're signing the state of use agreement saying, I understand this is protected information, it's, it, it's de-identified, but there still might be revealing information. And I promise I won't do anything bad with it. I won't redistribute it. I won't try to re-identify it. And at least if you have that, you've, you've taken a big step towards um, making sure that the person getting the data knows what they're getting into. The identification is a big part of it. You have to be able to um, get rid of the HIPAA identifiers before you can release this information. That causes some problems because some information is necessary for doing your research, especially the temporal information might be important. Um, and when you replace identifiers, it can cause problems because you get character offsets or temporal adjustments or even using surrogates can, can cause problems. So de-identification is something that's um, I'd say it's still a research question, but it's fairly mature, and there are lots of systems to do it, but it's, we haven't answered all the questions about what the best way to do it is. We have to remember that de-identification is not anonymization. Just because you removed all the HIPAA identifiers doesn't mean that you couldn't identify a patient if you knew some information about them because it's a very unique case or there's, there's very sensitive information, and, and that's the reason that de-identification is not considered just, you know, anonymized. When you think about secondary data use, you know, the data for the patient is collected at the hospital and stored at the hospital, and the secondary use of that data is when a researcher uses that data. When you're redistributing the data, it's a similar model, but now, now the hospital is the owner of the data rather than the patient being the, the person who's generating the information that's in those reports. And there's a custodian that's going to store that data, and the custodian now is, is a middle person that will give the data to a trusted recipient. But that involves a lot of trust because that hospital has to trust that data custodian. And the data custodian has to trust the data recipient. In addition to the security and privacy issues, the business model is a real issue to, to think about, just like in Lynette's um, talk, the cost. Um, how do you fund the maintenance of this? And it costs money to maintain a database, to email users and respond to their requests, to look at their DUAs, sign the DUAs, get your security officer and your legal department to sign all these things. It's a lot of time and a lot of effort and um, the University of Pittsburgh repository is an example, I think, of how this, the, the business model was a, a barrier that where's the funding for this and who's going to pay for it. So there's always questions of, well, can we charge for the data use? Um, maybe you ch don't charge researchers, but you charge industry. That's a model that lots of researchers like. <laughs> Uh, and then the data use agreements, if you, if you have them for multiple institutions, how do you keep track of them all? And, you know, there's lawyers everywhere getting involved in this. So the goal really is to have an inexpensive distribution of, of the annotations in the text and to ideally have them in the same place, although that might not be feasible. You have to think about all these different issues. Doesn't this seem like? So how do we address then some of these issues? Um, with privacy and security, there are environments, kind of cyber infrastructures that are being developed that are HIPAA or, or FISMA compliant environments. Um, we're building one here at, the, at UC San Diego called iDash. Um, Amazon, the Amazon cloud is, is an environment, I don't think it's HIPAA compliant, but I think there are, yeah, it's not. But there are HIPAA compliant clouds available commercially, I think, right now. Um, then, but on top of that, there are also, there's, this, there's another workshop going on right now in a different building, and it's a privacy workshop, and a lot of what they're do, working on is algorithms for quantifying the amount of privacy that you have and for cr controlling it so that you only let out a certain amount of information to researchers with techniques like differential privacy and key anonymization. And I couldn't tell you too much about those, but I could tell you who to talk to if you're interested. <laughs> 
And then there are a lot of open source de-identification tools that are becoming available to help us de-identify the text. So we're addressing this, these issues. Um, data use agreements. If you have data that you want to distribute, you know, how do you create a data use agreement? What needs to be in the data use agreement? What's going to please the lawyers? And so we've gone through a bunch of data use agreements that we've seen. This is work with um, Nicole. Oh, I'm just having a brain freeze. Nicole. Yes, Nicole Walters. I don't know why her last name just escaped me. Looked through a bunch of data use agreements for clinical data and for biomedical data and pulled out, you know, what are the elements in these data use agreements and can we create a customizable data use agreement that would, would have kind of these default required elements that have to do with the stewardship, the custodian stewardship, optional elements about the contributor and what preferences do you have, and then the infrastructure where you host that information has to accommodate those preferences. So if, it, if your data use agreement says the user must notify us of any PHI in the data, personal health information, then you have to have a mechanism that they can notify you. You can change the, you know, correct the error and distribute that new report to all those people who have your data. So the infrastructure has to back up what you require in your data use agreements. The types of things that are in these data use agreements, that who are the participants, what type of data, what's the term of agreement for the data, can the people, if you use the data, can you redistribute it, how does it need to be stored, can you re-identify it, um, et cetera. The responsibilities of the custodian of the data, what if you want to um, terminate that, um, that relationship, what are the requirements for that. When somebody requests the data, what type of reporting requirements would you like of them? Do they need to reference a paper that you have? Um, what if you change your mind, et cetera? And what if there's a breach? Then what happens? And then, and then options. So I'm going to show you. We, we're, this isn't live yet, but it's on the, oh, yeah, I can't do that yet. It's on the um, staging site of the uh, wizard for creating your own data use agreement. So the target of this is you have some data, so let's say it's Gargana has this data set, and she wants to put it on iDash or anywhere else, and she wants to create a data use agreement so that when somebody comes to use that data, this is the data use agreement they would sign. So you can, you can build your own here, and it has four sections. What's the general information about you, information about the project, information about the data, and, and then characteristics of the data set. So you go through and you fill out information, you know, what's your name? Etc. the contact person, who's the legal contact person for this? Um, oops. There we go. The title of the project, what, what's the domain? Is it clinical records? Is it population, proteomics, etc.? An abstract for your project. Um, the, what's the name of the data set? Is it structured data or unstructured? If it's unstructured, is it text? Is it video? Is it images? What's the size? Um, who can have access to that data? Is it only a, a private group, or can it be made publicly available? If it is only a private group, who, who can have access? So the, the PIT data set was only for NLP researchers. Nobody else could have access to that. What's the data set privacy classification? Does it have protected health information? Is it a limited data set, et cetera? And would you like to be acknowledged if somebody uses your data set? And if so, what do you want to, them to say in the acknowledgement? What paper do you want them to reference, et cetera? Uh, do you have documentation about the data set, like the schema or the guidelines that were used to create the annotations? Any supplemental software that goes with it? Who are the t target users of this information? And um, are there annotations? So once you fill in all this information, you hit submit. And what it does is it creates a data use agreement that's filled in with all of your information. So now it has it has the date and go down here. Oh, it doesn't seem to be filled in with all the information I put in. Well, it's probably got bugs, but it should have things like, um, you know, this should be checked because I marked a limited data set, et cetera. But you can create a custom data use agreement. Now you can take that to your lawyer. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be, you know, this is the proofs in the pudding now. Can you really use this? Hopefully our lawyers like them. <laughs> and they helped us build it. But just trying to come up with ways to, to decrease the barriers to sharing your data. 
because if, if you go to share your data and you think, I don't know how to do a data use agreement and what am I going to do about privacy and all those things, that's what iDash is trying to do is just to decrease that, that burden. All right, so with the cyber infrastructures, we have, we have the opportunities to share this data. So what are the different models for how we might set up a data repository with clinical data? A couple different models that exist. One is the, the LDC model, where they host and maintain and they distribute data, and the owners decide who gets to have the data, how much it costs, whether it costs anything, et cetera, and the Linguistic Data Consortium is the host. They hold on to it all. And that's been, that's been around for 20 years. It's been a good model. Another model is, a, but I don't know that that's going to work for clinical records. I don't know that any of the hospitals that we have access to will put their data at the Linguistic Data Consortium. It's to be seen in the future. A federated model is where you have, it's kind of a meta database management system where you keep your data in a local place, but there's one virtual place that organizes it all. And everyone applies to that virtual place, and it goes out and it, and it grabs the data and from the other places and, and sends it to the requester. And so they're all just interconnected via computer network, but you remain autonomous. I think that's desirable in lots of ways. It's logistically more challenging. Still, I think it's not very appealing to a lot of hospitals. Another model is kind of a benchmarking environment model, where you don't actually ever give the data away. But you host um, an environment where people can upload their code, and they can run data on these benchmarking sets, and they can get results back. And maybe there are, maybe there's a small part of the data set that they do get back that they can see the errors, or maybe you can classify the errors. Um, I think it's a nice idea. I don't know that you know the devil's in the details, as someone said earlier, and I'm not sure that's that that's sufficient for us, that we can just run our part of speech tagger on Gargana's data and get back the results. We, we need to do error analyses and, and figure out what went wrong, but maybe we don't need the whole set to do error analysis, so I think it's worth exploring, and that's something we're trying to set up on iDash to be able to facilitate that. So in conclusion, there's a, there are a lot of different models, I think. There's other models that I didn't talk about for how to share the data. Um, but it's, it's just not clear what the best model is and who's going to like which model. We have enough experience, I think, that we're very wary <laughs> and nervous about sharing the data, but we also have been able to break down, you know, what are the issues that make the sharing the data scary? They're with new technologies like cloud systems that, and privacy technologies. It, I think it gives us hope that, that we can allay some of the concerns from the institutions that own own the data and with these hosting infrastructures. But ultimately, it's really, you know, how do people feel and what are their fears and what are the politics behind it all? And those are a lot harder to control. So with that, I'll ask Gurgana to come up. And I, um, I don't see, how much time do we have? Do you know? Okay. Took longer, but but since it is a panel, let's come up here. And sorry, Noemi couldn't be here today. She would be sitting with us. What are your thoughts, Bob? I've got the microphone again. <laughs> it's my first thought. Um, Gurgana, I was just going to ask you a question about. Um, how much data you needed in terms of, say, I mean, you just pulled the number of a million tokens, which was, you know, the Penn Tree Bank size. But you could argue that the Penn Tree Bank is not nearly enough data for parsing. Um, it only covers one very limited, you know, genre of the Wall Street Journal. And with medical data, you have a lot of varying genres in terms of who provided the information, how they provided the information, whether it was dictated and transcribed or whatever. You have changes over time, like at least the Columbia medical records have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. So something that would, some, a parser that would work for today's data wouldn't have worked for 10-year-old data. So are you trying to balance that kind of thing or trying to get representative samples or how are you dealing with that issue? Yeah, excellent question. And we have struggled with that a lot. Um, and actually, my philosophy is the more annotated data we have because of the diversity of the clinical notes, the better. So one million, it's how do you represent all the specialties and all types of notes and all the clinical conditions in 
one million tokens, which is approximately 1,000 nodes, I think. Um, and we um, actually very carefully created a sampling methodology to try to have some representation of the diversity of nodes in what we are annotating. So it's, it's a start, and I'm not saying that this is the end. And what we are trying to do is in every single NIH grant that we are submitting, we are wrapping in annotations uh, and annotation projects, and the hope is to increase the set of the annotated data with consistently annotated data. I want to underline that and emphasize it, um, that it's consistently annotated, so you can merge uh, the data sets, yeah. Just a quick question about one of the core, the MIPAC corpus, and some of this, uh, a little bit about the sharp there. So basically, the Q&A and clinic and narrative, do they include speech, or is it just no, text? No, no, it's just text, we didn't do speech. So, and, and the text comes from transcribed speech, I assume? The, the text is the clinical notes. So okay. if... Uh, the clinical notes are the narrative in the electronic medical record. So whether it's generated by text-to-speech, um, sorry, speech recognition, and then edited by the physician, or whether it's directly typed by the physician, we don't care. We take the finished product, and that's our starting point. And that's also for the questions and answers. And for the que exactly, so the questions, there is a clinic, a collection of clinical questions of about 5,000 questions. So we worked with that collection. And then there are some, in the annotations, there are some components and annotations specific to question answering, like the expected answer type, um, uh, the answer content, the matching between the question and the answer content. But I would say probably 90% of the annotations are completely reusable. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very encouraging to know right now at least, uh, you know, a significant amount of uh, um, clinical notes are um, almost available or available in the, um, in the future, even though maybe still not enough. Um, so our experience is that we, uh, uh, we actually have to also, at the same time, annotate some of our notes um, within our institution due to the you know, the specific specialty we want to focus on, or, you know, the institution specifics of the um, linguistics. Uh, our experience was uh, we realized, well, sometimes, um, you know, even using two annotators, uh, if they don't have the necessary, you know, medical background, uh, there are still things that they miss. If both miss at the same time, which, you know, doesn't surface as something need a physician review, um, that would actually hurt our annotation um, accuracy. So um, for the several coppers, uh, um, the projects you're involved with, uh, how, how do you deal with that uh, um, problem or difficulty? Oh, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> so uh, the annotation projects are in collaboration with University of Colorado, Martha Palmer's team. Um, and um, some of the, so the way we have, we are doing it is that we have um, domain experts who are actually helping with the domain specific annotations. We have three full time domain annotators, uh, and they, they're trained in clinical, the billing coding and we retrain them to do the actual domain annotations. They do not do any of the linguistic annotations. For the linguistic annotations, we have Martha's uh, team and the tree bankers, but the domain-specific annotations, like the entities, the UMLS, they're always done in teams of uh, linguistic annotators and the domain annotators, and the adjudicator is always a domain uh, annotator. But I agree, it's not an easy process. Yeah. It actually increased the annotation cost, as uh, I think uh, Lynette talked about it earlier today. Right, right. right. Yeah. right. But, but at the same time, what we are trying to do is do general purpose annotations, something that we can reuse. So our goal is to create as I said, semantic, to do semantic parsing of the clinical narrative and eventually have 
the corpora, the, all the EMR, imagine all the narrative in the EMR annotated semantically, and then you can apply to many use cases. So if you want to discover all the patients that have RA, you can. If you want to say now, and these are real use cases, by the way, if you want to discover the anatomical sites associated with the RA, you can also data mine that because that's already annotated, already indexed. If you want to discover correlations between the severity of a disease, of the RA disease, and the medication given for that disease, you can also do that. So imagine 90% of all the clinical investigation questions and point of care questions being able to be answered by, by those rich semantic annotations. So that's, and I think that will it's it's a uh, there is a huge uh, return on investment. So you yeah, I totally invest, agree. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I think we'll stop there because we've got to move on to the demos, which will be an exciting part. And so there's not a break between, and I'm the first demoer. <laughs> oh, but we'll thank everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>